this is a two-part series on exploring the sunlit sea. And the sunlit sea is actually a very small part of the ocean's total volume. And it's only the really the upper 200 meters. And yet that zone covers more than 70% of the Earth's surface. And around 90% of marine life lives there where there's enough sunlight to allow for photosynthesis and the production of food. And uh, we'll deal with that in more detail next week when we take on phytoplankton, the keystones of a healthy ocean. But today our focus is on coastal wetlands and in part my personal journey through them. Um, I have a thing for wetlands. When I was seven years old, my family bought and we moved to a small farm in northeastern Ohio and it had a creek running through the property. This is not the creek, but it was basically this size. And I spent the next six years splashing in the creek, swimming in the creek, fishing in it, and developing a love of the outdoors that was really instrumental in my decision to become a geologist. At the back edge of our property, there was a small marsh big enough to house a grove of mature sycamore trees. And I can still remember in my mind the reedy call of the red-winged blackbirds that frequented that, those trees in the summertime and hearing from our house in the late afternoon and evening the boom de boom boom de boom boom de boom which some of you might recognize as the call of an American bittern. There were a pair of them that also nested in that little marsh. It was a strange place. It was not connected to the creek and it had plants and animals that were unlike any others in the area. And I was absolutely fascinated by it. And that fascination has pretty much stayed with me my whole life. So today we're gonna to talk about coastal wetlands. And this is the outline, what they are, why they're there, what they're like. And then I'm gonna take you with me on the exploration of a modern estuary and its ancient predecessors, some research that I did when I was with the Geological Survey. And we'll talk about the, the value of coastal wetlands and finish with wetlands as a threatened resource. So what are coastal wetlands? Well, I like the EPA definition, a permanently or episodically inundated tract of land near or adjacent to the sea. <clears throat> Why are they there? Well, they require two things. You need to have a lowlands um, adjacent to the ocean and the continent, and it has to be protected from the open sea. And some of that protection comes from the sea itself, because as waves approach a shore, they change their shape from a rounded crest to peaked crests. And that impacts the movement of water above the seafloor and the movement of sand on the seafloor. So in deep water, where the waves are sinusoidal or very smoothly curved, the amount of water that's tra transported under the crest of the wave is the same as that which is transported in the opposite direction under the trough of the wave. And since the wave is symmetrical, the amount of time for that movement is the same. So the velocities are the same. But when you get into shallow water and the waves start to peak up, you still have the same volume of water moving landward and seaward, but there's less time for it to move landward under the crest of the wave. So it moves faster. And that faster flow under the crest of the wave is really important in terms of the transport of sand. It doesn't really transport water, but sand along the bottom is particularly sensitive to the velocity of the currents. And so that increased velocity drives the sand shoreward to the beach. And then when the waves build a beach, the wind takes over blows the sand up the face in the form of dunes. And the dunes get big enough, they become Fordune Ridge, which then 
isolate sea wetlands area with tide flats and sloughs and other wetlands behind it. So that's the origin of many of the wetlands that we have. You can see the barrier out there by the toward the ocean near the top of the screen. That's the beach and dune system. And then behind it, this very complex waterway system of the wetlands. And that's the nature of wetlands in the Gulf of Mexico and, um, and in the southeastern um, United States. Very, very extensive barriers with wetlands behind them. And it's also the origin of our own wetland here close at hand, Elkhorn Slough, because it's protected by a sand barrier spit much like those that I showed on the East Coast. Now, I'm a geologist and geologists uh, by contract have to bring plate tectonics into every lecture that we give. Well, maybe not really, but it seems like we do. And so the question is, do plate tectonics influence the nature of coastal wetlands? And the answer is they control the type of coastal wetlands. This is a map of the plates of the world, the big plates. And you notice I've drawn the, the continental margins in two different colors, blue and red. And the blue margins are margins that are within a plate. These are like the Eastern part of North America within a plate and there's not a whole lot of geological activity going on those mar on those continental margins. And so you get these broad, extensive wetlands behind a barrier beach. But on the west coast, the margin of the continent corresponds to the boundary between two giant plates. And so geology here is a lot more active. And as a result, the shoreline is more rugged and wetlands are much fewer. The <coughs> Coastal wetlands in the conterminous U.S. cover about uh, 40 million acres, and 81% of those are in the located in the southeast, the Gulf Coast or the South Atlantic states. And so, on the conterminous U.S. West Coast, large coastal lowlands are relatively rare. And here, I want to introduce the the topic of an estuary or the concept of an estuary. A partially enclosed coastal body water where fresh water from a river or multiple streams mixes with the oceanic salt water. So it's brackish. And that we, <coughs> excuse me, we have that in this image, um, we have the sea near the top and then behind that um, river fed water coming in and uh, the development of an estuary. The biggest estuary on the west coast is at the mouth of the Columbia River, the fourth largest river on the continent. And uh, so inside the mouth, the river mouth, that part of the estuary, there are extensive wetlands, mud flats and sloughs. And so that's one of the ways that we can get some fairly large um, wetland areas on the west coast. <coughs> South San Francisco Bay is often described as the largest wetland on the West Coast. It's an estuary because it's fed by the combined flow of the Sacramento and San Joaquin River systems, but the wetlands themselves derive from something else, and that is geological forces. <clears throat> because this is an area that's caught in a vise between two giant plates, the North American plate moving one direction, and the Pacific plate moving in another. And the result of this interaction is the land gets broken up into segments. Some of it moves up and forms hills and some of it moves down like South San Francisco Bay, where at one point there were really extensive wetlands before it became urbanized. And so this is basically a geologically created wetland area. <clears throat> 
Puget Sound in Washington is, also has a lot of waterways and it has a totally different origin because 20,000 years ago, a giant ice lobe extended down from the north and covered this whole area and it gouged out the Earth's surface and left this big depression that's filled by Puget Sound, which is essentially a glacial estuary. As you might suspect, today's coastal wetlands are geologically very young features. And they relate to the Pleistocene ice ages because during these ice ages, vast quantities of water were locked up in ice sheets that were miles thick, covering half of North America and perhaps a quarter of Eurasia. And all that water had, to, or all that, you know, the water to form that ice had to come from the sea. So sea level drops during the glacial phase. And so we look at the late Pleistocene sea level curves, we see this fluctuation of 100 to 140 meters that correspond to the periods when water was locked from the ocean into the glaciers. And um, <clears throat> so if we look at the last of these, we have a sea level rise that goes up starting around, oh, 18,000 years ago. The ice sheet starts to melt and sea level comes back up and it reaches a uh, at more or less its present level about 8,000 years ago. And there's been a recent study of an estuary in Southern Spain that chronicles this rise and the development of wetlands in response to it. This is what we have today in the Tinto Odiel estuary, uh, fairly extensive wetlands that are protected from the sea by a, a large barrier. But 10 to 12,000 years ago, when sea level stood many meters below its present level, this was essentially a set of river valleys that merged and went through, drained on down to the Mediterranean Sea that was uh, substantially at a lower level. But then sea level rose, basically reaching pretty close to its present position about 6,000 to 6,500 uh, years ago. And uh, the estuary was, was filled with water, but no, no wetlands at this point. About a few thousand years later, though, we do have wetlands starting to fill the upper reaches of this estuary. And they build out uh, 1400 AD, the, the 15th century. We've got extensive wetlands, uh, pretty much what we have today, which is just kind of a filling in of that. And one of the important points on this is the difference in time, and we're going to come back to this at the end, the difference in time between the reaching of current sea level when it came up and the time we started to get wetland establishment, a difference of a couple thousand years. So what are the habitats of coastal wetlands? Well, this cartoon kind of shows the, the main ones that we have. Deep water offshore doesn't get into the estuaries. They're basically pretty shallow. And we have subtidal environments there. Subtidal just means that this is part of the bay that's never exposed. Even at the lowest low tides, you don't get exposure. So that is below the tidal level, it is the subtidal part of the bay. The beach and barrier system blocks the bay off. And then we get the intertidal inside the bay. And this is the part of the, the bay in which the water level ranges from the lowest low tides to the highest high tides, the astronomical high tides. And above that, 
is a supertidal zone. And this is a zone that's never inundated by the astronomical tides, but storm tides can flood these areas. And so that sort of constitutes the main part of the, or the main parts of a wetland system. And it's enclosed within non-marine deposits that are not part of the, never inundated by water and uh, not part of the estuary system. So coastal wetlands are variable complex ecosystems and they have a lot of diverse interlocking components. Mangrove swamps are common in many parts of the world or specific parts of the world and are a wetland that is really common in the low latitudes. We do have wetlands in North America, but they're pretty much confined to Florida, the mangrove wetlands. Then we have seagrass beds. And seagrass beds are common to estuaries all over the world. Um, they provide shelter, food, oxygen, they're a nursery for, for immature and young organisms, and they stabilize the soil with their root system to keep it from being eroded. So they're, they're very valuable. And they are abundant in Elkhorn Slough. But in Elkhorn Slough, up to this century, they were not doing particularly well. And they were encrusted by a lot of algae and other stuff that essentially blocked the sunlight to the blades. And this century, early in this century, the otters came back to Elkhorn Slough. And when they did, the seagrass meadows recovered. And a study showed that what was going on was there was a little sea hare, the Taylor's sea hare, that's about the width of a blade of eelgrass. And it crawls up and down the grass, eating the algae and the encrusting material that sits on top of it. So, so it's basically a cleaner of the grass. But before the arrival of the sea otters, there were lots of crabs in Elkhorn Slough that essentially kept the population of the Taylor sea hare low. And so it wasn't effectively cleaning off the grass. Well, the otters got into the bay and they loved to eat the crabs. So the crab population dropped way down and the sea hare population went up and the seagrasses in Elkhorn Slough recovered. So they're complex ecosystems out there. Above the seagrass meadows are the salt marshes, which are inundated by daily tides and um, a thick growth of variety of, of, um, of plants that live in that particular environment can tolerate salt water. And um, they, are, they create a very spongy soil because much of that soil is just decayed plant matter. And, um, from personal experience, if you have to hike a long way across the salt marsh, you're really glad when it's over, especially when you've got a bunch of these little runoff channels cutting through it that you've got to get across en route. But they are very productive places, um, provide a lot of food, a lot of resources for the organisms that live there. If you don't have plants growing in the intertidal areas, you get things like a sandy tidal flat. You can tell this is a sandy tidal flat because you can see the ripples in the foreground, then they only form in sand. This next picture is from a harbor in New Zealand. And the picture is a bit, dis I found it a bit disoriented, disorienting until I focused on the footprints. And once you look at the footprints, then you get a sense of much better sense of scale. And you realize what we're looking at here are a series of small sand dunes that are facing toward us. They were moving toward us. And they're covered by small sand ripples that sit on the very surface. Mud flats are basically the same thing, except they're made of mud instead of sand. 
And you can tell this is a muddy type flat because you can see mud cracks where it's drying out. And they are crossed by what I call runoff channels. These are places where the tide, after the tide is in, it starts to go out. It just doesn't flow out over the entire area. It flows out in discrete channels like this. And these channels in a muddy tidal, intertidal system take on an amazing dendritic pattern. This looks like the roots of a plant. And if you see this pattern, you fly over a, a bay and you look down and you see this pattern, you know you're flying over muddy tidal flats because you don't get this pattern if they're made of sand. Sandy tidal flats do have runoff channels, but they're sinuous and, uh, and shallow and uh, don't show that spectacular dendritic pattern. There have been a lot of studies of the intertidal parts of the coastal wetlands. And this really began after the Second World War when geologists from Germany and also England studied the extensive salt marshes and intertidal areas on the North Sea. And um, they put together the ways to recognize tidal deposits. And so there have been many studies of modern tidal flats, but these all end at the water. There were basically nothing known about what goes on beneath the surface of the sea in the wetland area. Which takes us to our next topic, exploring a modern estuary and its ancient predecessors. 1972, we were basically finishing up our studies of the Southern Oregon open coast. The paper that summarized the results of our research had been published the preceding year. And it had uh, taken the out, it had been awarded the Outstanding Paper of the Year Award for the journal in which it was published. And um, what we were finding in 1972 is mostly just reinforcement of, of observations and conclusions that we had made before. So it was time to look around for something new. And I knew that there had been no real intensive studies, particularly involving underwater research in estuaries and wetland areas. And there was a wetland area on the Pacific coast that looked particularly enticing for this, Willapaw Bay on the coast of Washington, north of the Columbia River. And what made this bay particularly interesting was first of all, its size and complexity. It would, it's been described as the second large largest estuary on the West Coast. <clears throat> but more importantly, there are no large cities on that bay. There are a number of small rural communities, but nothing big, no industry. And so that bay is pretty much in pristine condition. It's as pristine as an estuary gets on the West Coast. So, in 1973, we went, or 1972 rather, we went up to Willapaw Bay to see if this would be a promising research target. And this was a point in time that no longer exists, but we were living in the post Sputnik area, or post Sputnik era, when doing good science for science's sake was possible. And um, so we went to Willapaw just to see if we could make a major contribution by understanding how estuaries work geologically. And it was a beautiful estuary. It's big and um, fed by a number of rivers, mostly small. And again, no large settlements anywhere on it. Uh, extensive tide flats, and it produces about one sixth of the nation's oysters. And fresh Willapaw Bay oysters are uh, really quite tasty. 
So the bay itself is protected from the ocean by the Long Beach Peninsula. This is a tract of land made of sand that's been carried north around Cape Disappointment and moved north by the currents producing this, this very long barrier. This is a view of the Long Beach Peninsula from Cape Disappointment. You can see it heading off into the distance, 28 miles of continuous beach and some pretty violent waves on the outside. Uh, extending on up to the north, it ended in a spit at the entrance to Willapaw Bay. And this is an area that has changed a lot in recent times. Uh, the first maps showed the shoreline coming down a couple of miles further than they do today. There's been that much erosion on that northern side. And erosion was continuing even while we were doing our work there. The waves on the Washington coast can be big. In fact, they can be very big. But inside the bay, it's all peaceful and calm. We're looking out toward the west and seeing the Long Beach Peninsula from the eastern shore of Willapaw Bay. So we're looking across the bay at the peninsula. So the question was, was the water clear enough to allow diving research? Could we get anything done there uh, if we went and looked at the bottom? And one of the oystermen was kind enough to take us out on his oyster dredge. And we spent a day, at a, or spent a high tide diving at various places in the bay. And it's not terribly deep out there, 30 to 50 feet eminent diving depths. And the clarity was not great, but it was like 10, 15 feet, plenty good enough to do underwater research. And so that part of it looked promising. But we also wanted to get information on the smaller rivers, um, like the Palix River here. And so in 1972, we made several dives across that river and found that, yeah, the visibility dropped down substantially in the river, but you could still see three, four feet, something like that typically, which was plenty good enough to see what was going on on the floor of the river and to, uh, to do any scientific studies that needed to be done. So it looked like we were going to have no problems doing diving research in Willapaw Bay. But we also discovered another thing about the bay that was really exciting. And that was that the sea cliffs along the eastern side of the bay exposed deposits. They were made up of mud. And there's a person for scale over on the, uh, on the right hand side. And um, so this is a pretty, pretty thick accumulation of mud. But also we got thick accumulations of sand. And it was pretty clear looking at these that they could only form in an older set of bays. And so here we had a situation where we could study a modern bay, but we also could compare what we were seeing with the deposits that had formed in similar environments um, in the last several hundred thousand years. And there were interrelations of those deposits. Uh, you can see in this slide, and I don't know if you can see the arrow as I move it, but there is a contact here where this younger unit, or this older unit rather, is truncated. And it's mostly flat lying muds. It's truncated by something that looks a lot more sandy. But as you go up, it flattens out. This is a, a we're looking at two very different episodes of the filling of the bay when there was a significant change between these two in the sea level. And these Pleistocene terrace deposits were really present out all along the eastern side and the northern side of the bay. 
So here we had an opportunity to look at a modern bay in all of its different parts and compare what we were seeing to Pleistocene deposits that formed, we thought, in the same environments um, and um, really be able to identify, come up with identification uh, criteria for ancient estuary deposits. So our thrust was really threefold. Uh, one of the research thrusts was in the main axis of the bay. The second part was in the tidal rivers and the upper reaches of the bay. And then the third, sort of all the time going along with these two, was a study of these Pleistocene terrace deposits and uh, a connection between what we were seeing there in the ancient and what we were seeing in the modern sediment. In the main axis of the bay, what we, we used a technique called side scanning sonar, which essentially gives you an image of the seafloor off to the side. And what we're looking at here are a series of large sand waves or dunes on the floor of the bay. Probably something that would maybe like this at a somewhat different scale. And those dunes and sand waves were present throughout the deeper water parts of the bay. And one of the things we learned was that the water just didn't flow in in one mass and then flow back out again, but it actually followed pathways because we could use the side scanning sonar records to identify the dominant current directions because those would be the steep slopes of the dunes and sand waves on the sea, on the bay floor. And what we found was they occurred in patterns that the ebb flow would be prominent on one side and the flood flow on the other side of the, of the bay, of the channel. And sand waves as they move, produce a feature called cross stratification because the sand goes up the backside and cascades down the front. And this is an example of cross bedding in a sand. This is windblown sand rather than water laid sand. But you get sort of the impression this is, these are all sand waves that were moving to the right. And this is a modern sand wave on the inner tidal. And I don't know if it's just imagination, but I think I can see a faint, very faint lineation that's parallel to that dotted line that represents the cross bedding in that dune. But they were basically all over the bottom and we could look at places where they split one of the things we saw, as, as I noted, was that you've got areas that were dominantly flood oriented and areas dominantly ebb oriented. And this is a cross section through some of the sandy fill in those terrace deposits. And <clears throat> on the right hand side, just there's a lot of vertical exaggeration on this, but on the right hand side, the cross bedding shows it moving up the bay, flood dominated. But as you get over to the other side, it's moving, it goes to a ebb dominated. The cross bedding is facing in the opposite direction. And um, so we're seeing the same thing here in these ancient terrace deposits as we were seeing in the modern bay. And bay deposits have a very strange kind of sediment that's produced because it's there's a lot of mud out there that accumulates in discrete beds mixed with the sand. So you get this mixing of mud layers, which are shown here in gray, and then the sand in the, the brown. Uh, this, is, this is fairly typical of tidal deposits, bay deposits, and the really sharp contacts between the sand and the mud. Mud is probably there in fairly high concentration and when the water is still at a, at a still tide, um, it can kind of accumulate and blanket the bottom. 
and then the sand moves back over the top of it. In this picture, we're looking at some cross beds in the Pleistocene deposit up in the upper part of the uh, picture. And I think what we're seeing here are neap spring tidal cycles because you get a set of mud layers that are closely spaced, then they get broadly spaced, then they get closely spaced, broadly spaced, closely spaced. This is exactly the thing you would expect to see with a sand wave that was moving fair distances during the spring tides, but moving just short distances during the neap tides and between the slack water periods between the, the episodes of movement, the mud layers formed and armored the front of the sand dunes. So that was pretty much a summary of what we were doing in the central part of the bay. In the upper reaches, the tidal rivers, uh, we found the Palix River, that first one we dove in, was a really good place to study the deposits that are produced in this kind of a system. And it had extensive mud flats crossed with, uh, crossed by um, some fairly sized runoff channels. And the way we approached this was using a box core. This is a box that is made up of two parts that can be fastened together and then pushed into the sediment and brought back and opened up. And there you have a mass of black or gray gunk. And you don't see much in it until you use an x-ray. And once you, we had a little x-ray radiograph unit that we could get x-ray images of these cores and you can see the kind of detail and these dark streaks that run through it are root systems. This is, this is from the supertidal part of the bay or the, the upper inner tidal where there's lots of vegetation and lots of roots. The light colored areas, the streaks are sand layers the grays are mud layers. It's another example of sand, mixed sand and mud. In this case, you can see the effects of burrows that have mixed some of the sand and mud. And um, we could dive in the river and look at the different components and then how they would stack up and form a deposit. So the channel floor it was basically a hash of shell material and pebbles and all sorts of stuff. And that's what we saw in our cores, all mixed up, uh, no bedding, no layering in there because there were so an many animals churning it that you just never got any kind of stratification. And this is an example from the Pleistocene terraces, a shell layer that has lots of broken shells. And then right down about where the point of the machete is, you see, we're going into mud, and this is the mud that was below that channel of the floor of an ancient tidal river. So the river is eroding on one side, depositing on the other. And if we take the core across, set of cores across those depositing surfaces, we can see the patterns that develop the channel floor all mixed up with lots of shells and other hash. But then we get onto the channel banks. And the channel banks, the sedimentation is fast enough that the animals don't really have time to mix it. So we get lots of stratification. And as we move up to the top, we're starting to see a cyclicity of alternating sand, the sand layers and the muds. And these are yearly cycles. And we know that because one year we put down some very finely, fine lead shot in a little plot and then we watch the sediment accumulating over the top of. Now we've got a gap here, and that was a year in which there were no storms in the Pacific Northwest. So the light colored streaks are the winter deposits produced when there were enough big enough waves in the channel area to winnow out some of the mud and cause it, allow the sand to get concentrated. And see the same thing in the Pleistocene terraces, these alternating layers of sand and mud. And um, in this particular case, my guess is that these are yearly cycles. And what we're looking at is basically 20 years of accumulation 
on a ancient muddy tidal bank. And then at the top, we had the runoff channels with very distinctive kinds of, of channel-like features and the tide flat deposits over those. And then above that, we'd have salt marsh, super tidal. This is an X-ray radiograph of a modern root of a plant that's really common, Triglochan maritima, in the upper intertidal and uh, supertidal areas. Here's the same thing in the Pleistocene terraces. Eelgrass has rhizomes that are really kind of hair-like. And we started finding these. You could see this, these tiny little threads and little carbonaceous threads. These are eelgrass rhizomes, really great for identifying a specific environment. So the channels migrate. And as they migrate, they leave behind a stack of deposits. It extends from the channel floor with the shells and then the accretionary bank deposits that basically as thick as the water is deep. And then at the top of those, you can see runoff channels, intertidal flats, supertidal flats, all very distinctive faces and faces that you could find in the terraces. So we were able to look at a streak of terraces that covered a six mile interval, almost continuous exposure. And this is this exposed cliff about six miles. And so it goes A to B and then starts again to C. And so they're all, all connected up in one long exposure. And one of the things you can see right away is that it gets more complicated as we go south up the bay. And this is typical of what you find in the bay. As you get into the upper reaches, the tidal channels become smaller, more complex. And uh, so that, that fits exactly with what we were seeing. We also were able to get water depth positions um, to tell which was intertidal and which was subtidal. So we had a sense of how sea level had changed. And we also were able to get some dates, some geochemical dates on some of the shells. And putting those two together, we came up with a sea level curve or water depth curve for the late Pleistocene deposits. And as I put this talk together, I was curious to see how this fit with the modern day sea level curves that were not available at the time we did this study. And so how does it compare with modern global sea level, which is this curve? Well, you can see these, the red curves at the top are the intertidal and um, are the terrace deposits rather. And down at the bottom, they match up really pretty well with the sea level history of the Pleistocene. So we're looking basically at, in these terraces, at the last 250,000 years of history in Willapaw Bay. Diving could be problematic, but um, we managed to make it work. Uh, visibility was not always great and sometimes pretty poor. We wanted to, uh, to dive in a scar hole. Scar holes are produced where tributaries come together in an estuary system and they create deep holes where they merge. And we had one of these in the south end of the bay and we thought that would be a great place to see what's going on at the bottom of the scar hole. And we started off and the first thing we, we dove at high tide when the visibility would be at the best and the currents at the least. And we found that because we were getting the merging of these two ebb flows, the ebb tidal currents came on really fast and they came on strong. And so the first thing we learned was we had to really hug the bottom in order not to get washed away. And the second thing is that the deeper we went, the darker it got. And finally, it was like midnight and um, we were down about 30 feet, I guess, at that time. And so that was time to leave. And it's, it's kind of up the ironically named Sunshine Point 
this part of Willapaw Bay that, strictly speaking, is not part of the Sunlit Sea. So it was an amazing place for geologic research, and uh, that's the story on it. But I will come back a couple of times before we're done. I want to talk about the value of coastal wetlands. Um, they provide homes to more than half of the major seafood harvest in the United States. And they're home to juvenile fish like this endangered Central California coast coho salmon, um, juvenile Dungeness crabs like to live in shallow wetlands for the first two years. And so they're nurseries for fish and invertebrates, including some that are economically quite important. They're also a resource for migrating birds. And my guess is that some of you, maybe many, have visited Elkhorn Slough during the migration and seen this firsthand. And they protect inhabited coastal shores from erosion because they block the, or dissipate the force of the waves. And so you don't get nearly the same crashing surf on the habitat, uh, inhabited shoreline as you, as you would if these wetlands weren't there. Mangroves are particularly good at dissipating wave energy. That it's estimated that 50 to 70% of the wave energy is dissipated in the first 40 meters of a mangrove forest. So they really protect the shores. And of course, wetlands provide recreation. And this is, of course, Elkhorn Slough. They also are important in removing carbon from the atmosphere and storing it in the sediment. And I came across a term I wasn't familiar with before I started this talk, coastal blue carbon. Blue carbon is carbon that is sequestered by the ocean. And it's moved from the atmosphere and locked into the soil. And this happens in mangrove swamps, seagrass beds, salt marshes, all help to remove carbon from the atmosphere. And these are present globally, um, widespread and important. And the amount of carbon dioxide that gets removed by these wetlands is vastly greater than that that's removed by a tropical forest. But they're also a threatened resource. <clears throat> Threats come from a number of ways. One of them is invasive species. Um, this is Spartina, salt marsh grass, cord grass that grows, it's native to New England. And while we were working in Willapaw, we saw patches of it. The locals said, yeah, it's been there just like that since I was a kid and they hadn't changed very much. They'd come into the bay probably in the late 1900s when after the Olympic oysters were pretty much mined out of the bay by the oystermen. They brought the East Coast oysters in to see if they would grow, and they did not. But the, the Spartina, the cord grass that was used to pack them, got into the bay and it did grow. And it was pretty much benign for a hundred years or more, and then suddenly exploded this century and started to take over much of the bay. There were numerous attempts to try to, to stop it. Uh, mowing it was one. Um, local friends told me, sure, they mowed it and cut it up in little pieces, and then they spread around and sprouted all over the bay. So it may have actually been a contributing factor. But they finally got it under control using a, a specific herbicide uh, that has taken care of much of the uh, of the Spartina and allowed will allow the, the bay to return back to its original state. But there's no guarantee that that Spartina will not come back sometime in the future. But there's a new invader in town, and that is the European green crab. This is a crab native to Europe, 
that was first found in San Francisco Bay in 1989 and in Elkhorn Slough five years later. And it's since spread all the way up the coast to Washington. Um, it's a voracious crab. It it's, eats young shellfish, clams, and it can dig down six inches into the sediment to get them. Um, so it's a real threat to the oyster industries and any other climbing. It's basically put climbing industries in the East Coast out of business. So it's a, a nasty little or nasty little crab. And uh, last year, a person from the Washington Sea Grants crab team said in Willapaw Bay, we found European green crabs in every single place we look for them. And so there are a, uh, they are a potential problem that I don't know where a solution, if any, is. But the big problem is wetland loss. Coastal wetlands are one of the world's most rapidly disappearing ecosystems due to human impact. At current rates, within less than 100 years, most of the world's coastal wetlands will be lost. In California, since the 1850s, 90% of California's original coastal wetland acreage has disappeared and many of the remaining wetlands are in danger of being further degraded or destroyed due to diking, filling, dredging, pollution, and other human disturbances. So yeah, coastal development, converting a wetland to a marina basin is, um, is one of the reasons for the laws. But the big issue really is a combination of subsidence of the land, the sinking of the land, and the rise of sea level that is currently going on as the oceans warm. And it was estimated in a paper that got a lot of press last year that the Mississippi River Delta would be gone in 50 years and the coast of Southern Louisiana would retreat significantly by the year 2067, a huge loss of land. Our local estuary, Elkhorn Slough, has a current water level, as you look down on it, that's about like this. And these are the estimates, predictions by NOAA, various ones of sea level rise by the end of the century. And if you take that intermediate level, rise of a meter, essentially that would flood a good part of the wetlands of Elkhorn Slough. If you consider it a high, one of the high end predictions of two meters, that would flood a significant amount of that part of the coast and would probably drown out the wetlands. Now the wetlands will come back, they'll recolonize, but the timing involved is such that that may take hundreds, maybe even thousands of years before the wetlands would reestablish once they're flooded. So time is on their side, but it's not on ours. There is a growing awareness of the importance of wetlands and their habitats. And there are now efforts by many to restore depleted wetlands and protect those that are still in existence. So we're, people are becoming aware of the problem, but they, for me, are a marvelous place. And I certainly hope they are preserved. The tide comes in, the tide goes out. It's a peaceful place. Everything is ordered. There is serenity. I have a thing for wetlands. And thank you for listening.